Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish chapter two today. Um, this is where I left off. So the sections that we still got to finish is I got to finish expressions, then data conversions, and then interactive programs. Interactive programs is actually really short. It's just talking about how to how to uh, create interactive programs where you're using the scanner class to read data from the user, like I demonstrated uh, on the first lecture of chapter two. All right, so we've already went over all the different type of arithmetic expressions that we have in Java. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the remainder. Now remember that the addition also acts as concatenation when you're being performed on strings. That was one thing that we did talk about. And then this is where I stopped. Or this is where I stopped. What a, I can't remember, but yeah. So here's the next part. Okay, operator precedence. So operators can be combined into larger expressions. So here is an example of a larger expression. They have result is equal to total plus count divided by max minus offset. Operators have well-defined precedence which determines the order in which they are evaluated. Multiplication, division, and remainder are evaluated before addition and subtraction and string concatenation. Arithmetic operators with the same precedence are evaluated from left to right, but parentheses can be used to force order. Okay, so just like it, it works in math, if you look at this, okay, now a huge mistake that a lot of students make is for some reason they just think like this should be done first, right, and then this, right, but actually the way that the order of operations worked in math, it's you do your multiplication division before addition and subtraction, right, and the order in which they can occur from left to right so the first thing to get done is actually you divide count by max and then you go to the front and then addition and subtraction are done as they occur from left to right. So then you'd, you'd add total and then whatever the result of the count divided by max is and then minus the offset. Okay, so there is, it follows the same rule as it does in math. So here they kind of give you a tree of, or a tree, I thought there was a tree, oh, it's on the next slide. Um, they kind of give you these expressions, okay. And let's go through this and talk about the order of which these arithmetic operations occur. So the first one's pretty simple. It's all math. So it's done left to right, okay? So you, you add A and B, and then the result of that to C, the result of that to D, the result of that to E. This next one here, okay? Now, multiplication and division are done first in the order in which they occur from left to right. So B times C is done first because that occurred first before the division, and then D divided by E occurs and then you'll add an A to the result of B times C, and then you'll subtract that result of D divided by E from the result of A plus B times C. Does that make sense? So the first one is multiplication, the second one is the division, the next one would be the plus, the next one would be the last one would be the minus. This just like it happens in math. Okay, this next one here, okay, so remember, um, you can use parentheses, I haven't, we haven't done this yet, but you can use parentheses to force order, all right? So you actually evaluate parentheses first. So in this case, you're gonna add the B plus C first before you do this division, okay? So you're gonna, you're gonna sum B and C, and then you can come back to the front and you're gonna do A divided by the result of B plus C. The next thing to do is, this is division. The percent counts as division even though it gives you the remainder. So just treat it like you would multiplication and division. So that would be done next. And then the last thing to do is subtract. All right, this one here. Now you have nested parentheses. So you have to go to your innermost parenthesis. So the innermost parenthesis is D minus E, right? And then the next thing to do would be the, the next innermost parenthesis, which is C plus the result of D minus E. Then the next parenthesis would be the B times the result of whatever was the result of C plus D minus E, and the last thing you would do is take A divided by the result of all this stuff in parentheses. Might make sense, just like it happens in math, it also happens in Java. So here they have the numbers next to the order in which those operations occurred. So the first one, like I said, pretty easy, just straight down the line. Here is the next one, the multiplication happened first, then the division, then you came back and did the multiplication and then the subtraction. Here, you did the B plus C first, then you f found the result of A divided by the result of that. 
The next thing to do was this division, even though it gives you a remainder, it still counts as a division. And then the last thing to do would be the subtraction. Okay. Now this is the order in which Java does it all. Okay. So that you know what the result of, uh, of what you're doing is. Okay. Um, and then this one here, it just started with the innermost parentheses. It just kind of bubbled up out of the parentheses. So you did this, then the, you went to the next parentheses, and then the next parentheses, right? Started with the innermost parentheses, then the next innermost parentheses, and then the last set of parentheses, and then you did the division last. Okay, pretty straightforward. That's exactly the way it's done in math. Java follows that similar pattern. So just keep that in mind. Expression tree, we're not really going to I'm not really going to have you guys do any expression trees, but here they're saying that you can break these down into expression trees. So if you had <coughs> A plus B uh, minus C, right, where the B and the C is in parentheses divided by D, right, so the B and C happens first, so they just did this part of the tree first, okay? And then once this was subtracted, what was the next thing to do? Next thing would do is the result of B and C would have been divided by the result, or been divided by D, and then the next thing to do would be the uh, result of all this would be added by uh, A, or added to A. All right, uh, assignments revisited. So the assignment operator has a lower precedence order than arithmetic operator. So what they mean here is if you're assigning a value to some equation, right, uh, this is like, the answer is not going to be assigned, like sum's not going to be assigned to answer first, right? That's a, like the assignment operator happens after everything on this side of the equal sign is evaluated first. So the way that I like to tell students to think about it is just, it's almost like there's parentheses around all of this, right? It's just, right, everything on the other side of the equal sign would be evaluated prior to it being assigned to the variable answer. So here, um, remember, division and multiplication happen in the order of which they occur from left to right. So the division actually happens before the multiplication. I know uh, for some reason, like, people make errors because they think multiplication happens before division, but it actually it happens at the same time from left to right. And then once everything's evaluated, then it is stored, <coughs> excuse me, it is stored inside the answer variable. All right, um, all right, here's an interesting one. So the left and the, or excuse me, the right and the left hand sides of an assignment statement can contain the same variable. Okay, so what's actually happening here is whatever, res whatever count had inside of it before this line, just say count was five before we added one to it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take five and add one to it and then restore that result back into count. So after this line, a count would be six after this line occurs. All right, so all you're doing is just using whatever values inside of this variable, adding one to it, and then storing that result back into that variable. Okay, so it was like five above here, and then down here, after adding one to it, it's six. So we also have these incrementation and decrementation operators. So the increment is plus plus, the decrement is minus minus, Okay, you only use them on one operand. So if you wanted to increase count by one, then you put a plus plus, right? It's the same thing. Here they're telling you it's the equivalent of saying count is equal to count plus one. If you wanted to decrement count by one, then you just do the minus minus. Okay, now there is a huge difference between these two. I am gonna do, I'll do an example uh, after I read this slide. So the increment and the decrement operators can be applied in postfix form or prefix form, meaning it can have go at the end or the beginning of the variable. When used as part of a larger expression, the two forms can have different effects. Because of their so be, because of their subtleties, the increment and the decrement operator should be used with care. And they're not even gonna tell you what it does. That's funny. All right, so basically what's gonna happen is whenever you have a prefix form, increment or decrement, the result is going to occur on that line, meaning if prior to this line here, we say count was five, and then we increment it, now we have six, 
on this line, a count would be six. So if we had it part of a, a bigger equation, the, it's gonna use six wherever it's all count with the prefix incrementation on it. Now, if we had count with the postfix like we do here, if the result before we got to this line was five, on this line, count is gonna be five. It's not gonna take effect until the line is complete. So if it was part of a bigger equation, then it's going to use five in place of count plus plus. All right, so if it comes after, it's gonna happen on the next line. If it comes before, it, the result is going to take effect on that line. Let me do a quick demo of it because it's important to understand because I am gonna ask you some questions about this on your midterm. So I'm gonna come over here, open a file. I'm gonna save this. Oops, I'm gonna click that, or I guess I didn't mean to click that. All right, so let's see where we're at. Mm. All right, so I'm going to save this as increment increment demo one. All right, so I'm gonna say public class, name of my class, and public static void main, string array, arguments. Okay, so in here I'm gonna have num1 is, oops, I need to put a data type Oops, num1 is equal to, we'll just, for now, we'll just say five, right? Because that was the example that I was using. All right, so I'm curious, we're curious to see how the post and the pre-increment and decrement actually work. All right, so I'm going to have this as, I'm going to say, uh, count plus plus. And then over here in parentheses, I'll do uh, count when we're doing count I named it num1 I'm gonna change this to count count plus plus and then over here on this line I'm gonna do plus plus count so we can see what the value is on this line and put this right there plus plus all right so it's gonna be, you're gonna see some interesting results from this I'm gonna go ahead and open up command prompt I'm gonna change directory to Dropbox or to my uh, demos folder. All right, so I'm going to compile and I call this one increment demo one. And I'm going to run. All right, so on the first line, I got five, okay? And the second line, I got seven. So let's talk about what happened. We got five and seven. So what's actually happening, if you look back at the code that I have behind here, is the result was five at the very beginning. But remember, whenever I do a post fix incrementation, the count, this value here, was not gonna have its actual value until the line is complete. So even though I said add one to that number, it didn't actually take effect until the very next line. So if I were to do a system out print line, like right after that, then you can actually see the true value of count after that line. But on the next system out print line, I did the pre-increment. And what happens there is as soon as it uses count, it's going to actually have the one added to it. So on the line before this system out print line, count was six. And then we incremented it and it was seven. So it took effect like right there as we did that pre-incrementation. So if I come over here and just say, let's do a print line, count after above line, I'll print out count. I'll do the same thing on the next one. All right, and we can actually see what the result is after that top line. 
So let me move this over. All right, so when I did that increment, the post increment, right, this line right here, where are you, where are you? Right there. All right, so let me move that down a little bit. All right, so when I did this post increment, okay, it retained its value of five, meaning it didn't actually take effect. But on the very next line, I went ahead and just printed out count to see what value was contained inside of count. And you can see that it knew that it was six because I had added one to it from on the line above, okay? And on this next print where I do the pre-increment, it's seven immediately, and the line after it's still seven because it took effect as soon as I did the pre-increment. Right, any questions on that? You get two different results. You have to know the difference between the two because on your midterm, I'm going to have like some programming snippets to where you have to kind of tell me what result, like, like I'm going to give you like a variable result and you have to tell me like what value is going to be stored in result after a series of different arithmetic operations. And uh, I, I, I like to use the pre and the post increment to see if you actually understand what value is going to be in place in that equation. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so I'm going to hop back over to the lecture. So that is the pre and post. I do tend to test you a lot on that because it's important to know. All right, so here they're talking about this unique assignment operator that we, we can use. So often we perform an operation on a variable and then store the result back into the variable. Java provides assignment operators to simplify that process. For example, the statement num plus equals count is equivalent to num is equal to num plus count. All right, so if you don't have to write the variable out again, you don't have to. Now, you should know what the plus equals does. I know some students get confused by it. Uh, if it's easier for you just to write it out like this, just do it that way and, and avoid like the heartache of having to know like how what this is actually doing. So here is a list of the, all those different operations. They're telling you whenever you see the operator plus equals, minus equals, multiply equals, divide equals, and remainder equals, it's the same thing as, or here's the example of them using it. It's the same thing of, of if you're using it here, it's like saying x is equal to x plus y, right? x um, minus equals y is the same thing as x is equal to x minus y, right? It's like you're using that value on the other side instead of the equation kind of like a shortcut. Now, one thing you do have to remember, and I think they might talk about it on the next slide. Oh yeah, actually they do, I can see. So one thing you do have to remember, it's like the equivalent of wrapping the whatever is on this side in parentheses. So if you have like a complex uh, expressions going on here, where you're saying result, divide equals, all this stuff over here, it's the same thing as wrapping all this in parentheses where what's on the other side of the equal sign is going to happen first before you actually divide, right? So they're saying the above line is the equivalent of saying result is equal to result divided by, and then they had all this already wrapped in parentheses, right? I didn't add, I didn't add those there. That right, does make sense. So when you see this, right, whenever we're using like these little shortcuts, it's the same thing as saying whatever is on the other side is wrapped in parentheses. So you're going to do all those operations first. And then once you get the result, then you're going to use the operator on the other side, whatever the operation is. In this case, it was division. So result is equal to result divided by the result of all this computed. And then that would be what's stored back inside of result. All right. So the behavior of some assignment operators depends on the type of operands. So if the operand plus equal operator are applied to strings, then the assignment operator performs concatenation. The behavior of the assignment operator plus equals is always consistent with the behavior of the corresponding um, operator plus. All right, let me do a demonstration of that. So what they're saying is if you have plus equals on a string, it's just going to concatenate onto the string and assign the value back to itself. So if I come over here and make a new, make a new one and save it as string, uh, 
I'll, you know, I'll just call this plus equals demo. Plus equals demo. So public class, name of my class, and then public static void main string array arguments. All right. So I'm going to have, uh, say I have an integer, I'll just say like num1 is equal to 3, and then int num2 is equal to uh, num2 is equal to 5. So if I do something like num1 plus equals num2 times 2, Okay, this is the equivalent of saying num1 is equal to num1 plus num2 times 2, right? So I'm going to have 10 plus whatever result stored here. So I can expect num1 to hold the value 13 after this line is complete. Right, and let me just copy this, paste it right there, so I can show you the value of num1 prior to the operation and the value of num2 prior to the operation. All right, so hop over here and come to my screen, Java C, I named this one plus equals demo, compile and run. All right, so num1 is 3, num2 is 5, and the result was stored back into num1. So now num1 holds 13, right? And the, this, this value that's highlighted was 5. So I took 5 times 10, and then I added whatever num1 had in it, which was a 3. So it was 13, and then num1 had 13 inside of it um, on the very next line. Yes? So could you change the order of it by adding parenthetical or would you have to write out the expression? Uh, well, I mean, if you, if you put, I mean, there's no way to change, like, so you change, like, there's no way to change this order if you're using plus equals, okay. right? If you wanted to, say, add num1 and num2 first, then you couldn't use the plus equals. Like, you had, you have to write it out like this. You would have to completely write it out and say like num1 plus num2 and then wrap this in parentheses, right? Because you want that to occur first and then multiply by 2. You, you, you would not be able, like if this is the result you wanted, right, where you did the num1 plus num2 first, you would not be able to use this plus equals, right? So it always, it always defaults to where whatever's on the other side happens first. No matter how complex that is, that will happen first and the very last step is to take oh, take whatever values in the variable that's re getting the information put into it and then doing whatever operation you specified. In this case, plus. All right, yes? So if it was uh, reversed, the, the sign, so if it was num1 times equals num2 plus 2, num2 would be added to 2 before it was multiplied by num1? Wait, uh, wait, say again, Flora. So if it was what? So if the signs were reversed, I still not following. Let me, let me type this out. So if you're saying the signs were reversed, wait, what do you mean the signs were reversed? Like if, if it was a negative three, negative five? No, if it was a num one. Okay. Uh, add space asterisk equals. Okay, so you're going to multiply. Okay. And then num two plus two. Okay, num two. Would it be plus num two plus two and then multiplied by num one? Y yes, it would be num two plus two. So this would be equal to this this would be the equivalent of num1 is equal to num1 plus oops i'm sorry multiplied to num2 plus 2. so that's kind of i guess if you're if you're trying to do the math that you're like if you wanted to multiply num1 and num2 first then you would not be able to take that shortcut 
you would have to like write it all the way up. Okay, so so there's like these invisible parentheses that get placed around whatever's on the other side of the equal sign. Oh. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Those are really good questions. It's important to understand this because you will. I will throw them into my midterm, so you would have to at least. I know I'm not forcing you to use them, but you need to understand like what actually happens when they are used. Okay. All right. So when you use them on a string, let's just say I have a string, and I don't know. I'll just call it like name and name is equal to Mike all right so down here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say system out print line I'm gonna say name and then plus equals or excuse me plus uh, name all right and then here I'm gonna say name plus equals now you can only use plus equals on string there's no multiply equals on a string java won't even compile if you did that so remember the plus acts as concatenation when it's being applied to a string so over here what i'm going to say is num1 times num2 okay and this is the same thing as saying name is equal to name plus num1 times num2. All right, so now if I do a system that out that print line and I print out name, name was, is going to have the result of num1 times num2 concatenated to the end of it. All right, so I'm going to save that and hop over here, compile and run. All right, so 13 times 5 is 65. So like it, it just took num1 and num2, multiplied it, and then concatenated that result to the end of that string. Okay. Uh, if I were to try to do multiplication here, remember it's a string, so Java's not going to be happy with me. If I try to compile, it knows right away you can't use multiplication with a string. Okay. So you can only use this operator the plus equals on strings you can't use multiply equals divide equals minus equals or uh, remainder equals and any other questions on this all right all right so that is the end of that expression section it's pretty interesting there's a lot of stuff you gotta remember from this it's really just all those operators and then the incrementation, decrementation, and the shortcut where you have the plus equals, minus equals, multiply equals, and all that. All right, so the next topic, which is a little confusing, I know, or at least, it's, yeah, it's confusing. I'm just gonna read through these slides and then just do some demos on it. Uh, I think it's easier when you see examples instead of uh, just having like a bunch of content, like trying to understand uh, content. All right, so, the next one is data conversions. So sometimes it is convenient to convert data from one type to another. For example, in a particular situation, we may want to treat an integer as a floating point value. These conversions do not change the type of variable or value that is stored in it. They only convert the value as part of the computation. Widening conversions are the safest because they tend to go from a small data type to a large one such as a short to an int. So when they say widening, they mean this, the size of the variable. So we know that a byte is uh, eight bits, a short 16, an int 32, a long is 64, and a float 32, and a double is 64. So widening conversions happen uh, without having to like do any type of casting. They're safe because you're going from a small data to a uh, larger data. And there are in conversions, you can lose information because they go from a large data type to a smaller one, such as an integer to a short, a long to an int, a float to an int, even though float and int are both 32, you're actually going to a, you're actually doing a narrow conversion because a float can hold decimal places where an integer can't. So you're gonna lose those decimal places. In Java, data conversions occur three ways. Assignment conversion, promotion, and casting. Then here they give you the different uh, data types and 
what it is widening and narrowing. So basically, if you have a bite, you can a bite can be put into a short, int, long float, or a double without any problems. A short can go into an int, long float, double without any problems. Char because a char is a hang on, I'll just, yeah char is part of the Unicode character set. Uh, you can actually put that value that because it the char I don't know if I showed this to you I did show this to you guys right um, the char is actually given a number of where it occurs in the Unicode character set so it could go up to 65,000 even though it's 16 bits it's unsigned so it cannot fit into a short which can go up to that go from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000 so a char can only go into an int a long float or a double and it's just going to use the value of where it is in that Unicode character set, meaning the number, not the actual character. A long can go into a float. Is that true? What the heck? I don't know. Hmm. I have to think about that one. I guess it, no, it is true. Is it true? I don't know. I'm so confused. This is 64. This is 32. I know that float supports float, uh, floating point values, but I don't know how true this is. We'll find out. All right, so then a float can go into a double. Narrowing conversions happen when you go from a, um, you're basically going from a bigger data type to a smaller one. So here they're saying sh byte to char. I don't know if that's actually true. Yeah, I have to test it. Uh, short, to, short to byte or char char to byte or short, int to byte short char, long to byte short char int, float to byte short char int long, and double to byte short char int long or float. All right, so double is like the biggest one, 64 bits, and it retains decimal places. So if you wanna to go to a smaller uh, variable, right, you're gonna to have to force that value to be put into that smaller location. Okay, so assignment conversions. Okay, so these have been automatically whenever we assign a value to a, a larger data type. So in this case, they're giving you the example. They have int dollars is, is 20. And then they took that dollar variable and assigned that value to a double. Now double holds 64 bits, but Java was still able to fit, Java was able to fit any integer into a double. So there was no problems. We didn't have to do any special annotation or anything to force that integer to be a double, it just automatically converted. That's assignment. Promotion is the same thing, all right? So this is where you have two different data types in an equation. Java will automatically use the bigger one to store the result into that type. And then you're going to have to have a variable that is gonna hold that type. So in this case, they have an int for count 12 and then they have a double for sum which is 490.27 when they did this math where sum is a double and count is an integer count got auto converted up to be a double because Java saw that there is a double on this side so the math happened with two doubles okay that just means that you need to actually store the result into a double if you try to store it into an int then Java is not going to compile. It's going to say, hey, what's going on? You have a possible loss of uh, precision, and you're going to have to do find a way to force this double to be an integer if you actually wanted to store that value into an integer for some reason. So the value of count is, uh, is converted to a floating point value to perform this division calculation. Right? So these two are pretty simple. They happen all the time without us knowing. Right? It's just you're going from a smaller to a bigger type. You have the assignment conversion, and then you have the promotion whenever you're doing equations. Now, the one that's dangerous, right, this is where we go from, uh, we're actually narrowing, is called casting. So casting is the most powerful and dangerous technique for data conversion. Both widening and narrowing conversions can be accomplished by explicitly casting a value. To cast the type, to, to cast the type, put parentheses in front of the value being converted. So in this case, they have an integer total and then they have float result total divided by six but those are both integers they're casting total to be a float 
so that it can retain the decimal places. I'll show you an example of that. Without casting, the fractional part of the enter would be lost. All right, so let me hop over to here and do an example. All right, so that was a lot of information, but I'm hopefully when I do some examples, it would make sense. So I'm gonna call this one casting demo. All right, so public class casting demo and then public static void main string array arguments. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, let me see, what's the first thing I should do? All right, um, I do the example that we just saw, right? So we can just clear that one up first, okay? so. I'll just have this one called uh, value. I don't know. Let's say value or val. Okay, and val is going to be something with a fraction. Let's see. So we'll just say 13. Okay, and now I'm going to have a float, and it's, this float is going to be. Uh, I'll just call this one uh, float. Whoa, <coughs> sorry, almost coughed and talked at the same time. That was weird. <coughs> I'll call this one float one. And I'm gonna say float one is equal to value divided by two, okay? So value divided by two, 13 divided by two is what? Anybody know? 6.5, okay. I'm storing in a float, right? So the float should retain those decimal places. So if I come over here and say system.out.println and I'll say float one and then print out the value of float one, I'm expecting to see 6.5. When I come over here, clear my screen, compile, oops, uh, compile casting demo. It does compile, that's good. So running the program, the value stored in float is six, right? So what's happening is val I declared as an int Java sees two as an integer literal, okay? So I have two 32-bit integers here and here. So I'm dividing an integer by an integer. Whenever I divide an integer by an integer, that means I do not retain any decimal places, okay? I'm, I'm storing the result, which is an integer, into a float, all right? So the math was done as integers. You lost your precision of your decimal place and then you store the result into a float. The answer is 6.0, which doesn't make sense. We want to know what happened to the fraction. Now you have two, and you have two um, things that you can do here. The one that the book demonstrated was casting value to be a float. Now what's going to happen is Java is going to see this cast and make val a float for this operation. Okay, So I have a float here. You have an integer here. It does what it calls promotion. So it's gonna convert this integer to a float as well. And the result of this is going to be a float divided by float, which will retain the decimal place. And that result would be stored into float one. And then I'll print out my result float one. And I'll have my decimal place. So I compile my run. And now we have 6.5. All right, so the reason why I thought this was a bad example Right, uh, this is the way the book shows you, but I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and paste it so you can see both of them, uh, both results. And I'm gonna call this one float two. And float two, I'm gonna print out the result down here. Now, for now, it's going to be identical to whatever float one is, because I'm doing the exact same operation. So if I come over here, clear my screen, compile, run, you can see they're both 6.5. But if I didn't want to cast, which normally I don't recommend, uh, if, unless you have to, you, you can actually, well, you can tell Java, so this is an integer literal, we call it integer literal. You can tell Java, you know what, I wanna make this value a float. If this value is a float, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a float here, an int here, Java's gonna convert this to a float and do the math as float, and then the value is gonna be stored into a float. So 
for a floating point value, meaning a 32-bit number that can hold a decimal point, if we wanted to declare it what we call a float literal, we would have to put a lowercase f or an uppercase f after the two. Okay, so I'm going to put a lowercase f. I'm going to save it, and now I'm going to come over here, clear my screen, compile, and run, and now I get the same result, 6.5. Right, so instead of casting value to a float, I just tell Java, treat that as a floating point value. Okay, now another thing that you can do, uh, or some people do when they make this mistake, is if you say that's 2.0, okay, now Java doesn't see 2.0 as a float. Java sees 2.0 as a double. Does everybody remember how big a double is? 64 bits. So 2.0, 64 bits. Val is going to be up converted to a double to also be 64 bits. While we're doing this math, the result of it is going to be 64 bit number. Now we're trying to store a 64 bit number into a 32 bit number, right? Even though they both float and double, both hold decimal places, Java sees 2.0 as a double that's much bigger, 64. It's going to be upset at you. I don't, it won't even compile. Come over here, compile, and right away it tells me incompatible types, possible loss, uh, po possible loss of conversion from double to float. Telling you exactly what you did wrong. So anything with a decimal point written is Java considers to be what we call a double literal. So if you wanted to make a float literal, you have to put the F, even if you put the decimal place on it. So you need the F, lowercase or uppercase. It does not matter. I want to come over here and compile. It works just the same as it did before. Okay, so that is casting with floats. Um, there's a lot of other examples that I need to show you. So say we have a byte, and I'll call this one byte one i'll say byte one is going to be equal to uh some value that i'm going to cast to a from an integer all right so we'll say val up top all right all right so well actually let me show you this if i try to compile that that was going to be upset saying hey this is an integer you're trying to store it in a byte what gives when i come over here try to compile exactly as i said right so you're gonna have to force this integer to be a byte if you wanted to store it into byte. So I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to cast this to a byte. And now I'm going to go ahead and print out the value of that byte. So copy that, paste it, paste it, save. All right. So you can see that that byte now has 13. All right. So the highest value for a byte, because it's eight bits, it could only hold a possibility of 256 numbers. However, it is signed. So it actually holds from negative 128 to positive 127 because you have to include the zero. Um, the highest possible value for a byte is actually 127. So if I make this 127 up here and I come over here and compile and run, you can see that the byte is in fact, 127. But what do you think will happen if I try to make this something outside of the range, like 128? It would go around. Yeah, that's actually, uh, going around is actually correct. So what's going to happen is Java is going to try to convert that integer to a byte. So it's going to say, hey, you're past 127. I'm going to wrap that one value around and give you negative 128. Okay? So now when I compile and I run, you can see that the value is negative 128. Yes? Uh, well, because you're trying to, like you're telling Java, I don't give a damn if this number is too big for a byte. I want this value to be a byte. That's what casting is. You're telling Java, like, I don't care what, what you think. I want this 32-bit number to be an 8-bit number. And what it's going to do is just figure out, okay, well, you want me to force this to be within the range of a byte. It's just going to, like, just keep dividing by 127, I guess, or not 127, I guess 
256 and wrap, keep wrapping until it gets to that value. So whatever value it is over the factor of 256, does that make sense? Uh, oh, it's hard to explain. But anyways, the higher and higher you go over that value, it's going to be more and more negative until you actually wrap back up to a positive number. Like, for instance, if I make this 129, right, then we can expect that instead of being negative 128 here, it's going to be negative 127. Um, so I compile and run, and it's negative 127, right? It's going to keep going up. So um, if this value was, let's see, so 250, we'll say like 255. I'm curious to see what 255 is. 255 is going to wrap, like 127 is going to wrap, and then it's going to wrap again. Okay, that, may, that might be too high. How about like 250? All right, so I'm going to come over here, clear my screen, compile, run, and you can see that it's negative 6. So if I added a few more numbers, it actually would have went positive. So if I just said this was 260, it would have wrapped back up to being a positive number. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the drawback of casting numbers. For some reason, like if you wanted to force it to be like something bigger to be something smaller, then that's what's going to happen. Um, yeah. With doubles, it's going to drop the decimal place. Um, let's see what else. Oh, there's another one that's interesting. The long. All right. No, the long. Hold on, let me think about this. I do an int. Okay, so here's an int. Here's another int. I'm going to call this one int1. I'm going to set it equal to and the highest value for an integer is like, I already forgot. I don't have it all memorized, but I think it's like 2 million or something like that, right? So I'm going to just put like 2, 1, 2, 3, or 2 billion. Is it 2 billion or 2 million? I can't remember. So there's 3, there's 3. I need one more. I think this is 2 billion right here. So it should be okay with this value because it's like, Two billion something. Um, if I print this value out, All right, I'm gonna print this value out. Come over here, print my screen, compile, run. All right, it was okay with that value. But I think if I add one more, it's going to be upset at me. Okay, it is upset at me. All right. So I'm going to come back over here. I want to make this a long. Actually, I'll just keep this. Get rid of one of the zeros. And then make a new long over here called long. Yeah, long one. And come over here, paste, copy. All right. Um... It's the same value, just to kind of prove that I'll line them up. And I'm going to add one more zero. So a long is 64 bits. It should be able to hold, you know, this number because I forgot what the highest number for a long is. But um, it's twice the size, but really it's not really twice the numbers. It's actually more than twice the numbers because it's exponential. So it's going to grow exponentially, meaning I, I have no idea what the largest one is number is, but it's going to be much, much bigger than two times two billion, right? Um, but anyways, I added that extra zero, so long should be able to handle that value. But when I come over here, I clear my screen, and I try to compile, it's upset, right? Java's really upset at me, but it's actually telling you, it's not getting upset because the variable where you're trying to store it is, is not big enough. It's actually saying that the integer literal is too big, okay? So you can't have a number, a, a literal value that is bigger than the range of an integer unless you tell Java you want it to be a long literal. So how do you think we can tell Java we want this to be a long? Okay, so lowercase l looks like a 1. It actually still works, though, because it's an l, right? So if I come over here, compile, and run, it will work, all right? Uh, but it's always good programming practice to use the uppercase L when you're dealing with longs because the lowercase one looks too much like a one, all right? So using the uppercase L is the better thing to do just for readability. 
and it works just the same as the lowercase. Right? And that's what the problem was. Was Java was upset at me because without that L, it's like, hey, you're trying to make an integer literal, and that's too big to be an integer. Right? And I just had to slap an L on that. All right, any questions on this? So this is casting. Uh, if you do like a float to an integer, you're gonna lose the decimal places. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should probably show you. I think that's it. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. All right, so the last topic in chapter two there's, it's really small slides, um, is interactive programs. And this is where I talked about using the scanner class to read user data. I'm going to go ahead and read the slides, and then I should probably show you all the methods that you can call on it. All right, so let's see, interactive programs. So programs generally need input on which to operate. The scanner class provides a convenient method Convenient methods for reading input values of various types. The scanner object can be set up to read input from the various sources, including the user typing values on the keyboard. The keyboard input is represented by the system in object. The following line creates a scanner object that reads from the keyboard. So scanner, scan, new scanner, and then system in. That's where you're actually listening to the keyboard. The new operator creates the, ob the scanner object once created, the scanner object can be used to invoke various input methods, such as next line. The scanner class is part of the java.util class library and must be imported into the program to be used. The next line method reads all of the input until the end of the line is found. See echo. Uh, the details of object creation we'll talked more in chapter three. Okay, and then the last slide of information is this one. Uh, unless specified otherwise, white space is used to separate the elements called tokens of the input. The white space includes space characters, tabs, new line characters. The next line of the scanner class reads the input token and returns it as a string. Or excuse me, the next method of the scanner class reads the input token and returns it as a string. Methods such as next int and next double read data of particular types. And they give you an example, and then that's the end. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and show you some more examples on the scanner class. I hadn't actually covered everything, so I'm going to make a new one. I'm going to save. And I think I already have a scanner demo I do. So I'm going to call scanner demo uh, two, I guess. I mean, no, there's already a scanner demo two. Let's see. Uh, I'll call this one scanner demo advanced. All right, so the name of my class, public class, name of my class, and then public static, oops, static void main string array arguments. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and save that there. Um, now, it's always good programming practice to compile as you type, like, small lines. I'm, I guess I should go ahead and start demos, demonstrating that, right? I compiled. If I run, I'm not going to have any input or output because I'm not outputting anything. All right, so that compiles. That's always good. I'm going to hop over here and import the java.util.scanner. All right, I'm going to hop over here and compile. Okay, you should get in the habit of compiling after you enter a few lines. That way, compiled before, if I come over here and mess this line up, like I forget the semicolon, and I come over here and compile, then that was the last line that you just inputted, so you know that your mistake is on this line that you just added, right? You're not just like staring at your computer, waiting for me to come by to help you out. Type a line, compile, type a line, compile, right? Once you get your class and your main method done, then after that, after every line, just keep compiling, keep compiling. So the next thing to do is declare your scanner object. So I'm going to declare my scanner, specify the data type, which is scanner, and then the variable. Um, I always use scan or my scan. This time I'll use my scan is equal to new scanner. I'm going to pass in the keyboard 
because I'm going to listen to the keyboard. All right, so what I'm going to do here, or just kind of talk about what's going on here, is whenever we create an object in Java, we use the new, the new, the new keyword, okay? And that actually tells Java that you're going to put a new object into memory. And then this value here is the name of the class that we're using, but it's also what we call a constructor, which is a special method that is going to set up an object when you first create it. So we're saying, use this constructor to set up a scanner and put that object into memory. And then use this object reference variable to point to that object in memory so that I can use it in my program. Okay, we're gonna start doing more of this in chapter three, making objects. Uh, but I'm just gonna keep talking about these little details because you're gonna have questions on your test like, what does instantiation mean? What does invoking mean, okay? Uh, what's a constructor? You have to know these types of things. I know we haven't covered them yet because that's in the next couple of chapters, but it's good to start introducing them now. So I instantiate my scanner object, okay? Now what I wanna do is start reading input from the user. Okay, so I'm going to have a string for um, name and I'm going to do a system out, system out print, enter your name. All right, and then I'm gonna say name. Oops, what am I doing? Sorry. And then I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna say name is equal to my scan dot next line. We've done this a few times. And then I'll just say system dot out dot print line. Say your name is, and then name. All right, uh, save that, hop over here, compile. Wait, dang it, wrong demo. Uh, oh, I actually haven't ran it yet, that's why. So then Java scanner demo advanced. Okay, enter your name and I'll just put a bunch of stuff, hit enter and then I get my name right back, right back out. All right, so the next line, as the lecture slide said, it's going to read up into the end of line character. Now the scanner actually uses what, we, what it calls tokens, meaning it, it can actually parse out wherever you have space, right? And the way you get a token is by using a token scan, right? So next line is gonna read up to the end of line. But if I just wanted to grab the very first string separated by space, I can use next instead of next line. So now when I hop over here and compile and run, if I enter my name and I enter some space in here, actually I'll enter my real name. Okay, I press enter, it only pulled off my first name. Because when it reads that line, it's going to actually uh, use white space to separate each token. And by token, it just means that it's going to, the scanner is going to break this line up, or all your input up by space. So it's going to say, okay, well, here's a string, here's another string, and then you ask for the next. This is the next string right here, right? So... The last name would actually be another value that I can use. So over here, let's just say, okay, well, instead of doing name, I'll do F name and L name. Okay, so then F name will store the first token that I pull off that line. And then last name will store, L name will store the, the second token I pull off that line. So enter your uh, name. I guess I don't have to do two prompts. I could just scan here until they enter in both, and then I can just print out um, your first name. All right, and hop over here to compile and run. So I'm enter Michael and then my last name, press enter. And you can see that it, it scanned those two things in and it saw that my first name was this and my last name was that. If I clear my screen and run this again, uh, if I were only to, I'm not sure why I compiled again. If I were only to enter in just one name, press enter, 
you see the cursor just kind of hanging around, like waiting, waiting for like another string to be read from the scanner, right? Like I'm stuck on this line right now, right? This is the line that I, I'm at at the code. The code's just like, all right, I'm gonna sit here until the scanner gives me a next line, okay? So the cursor's right here. If I type in the next line, no spaces, right? Because it's gonna read it for the space. I then put a space and then like some L's, press enter. It read in my last name as this entire line here, right? It broke it up at that space and then left this part of it off. If I had like another scan next, it would have read that the, all those L's, okay? So that's what we call a token scan. There's actually a lot of different token scans that you can do. If you go to the Java API or to your book, which is probably a little easier to read, um, and look up the scanner class, I'm gonna click here. It was that's Java seven, but I don't think the scanner class has changed. And you come over here and look for scanner. Okay, now I know it's kind of there's a lot of classes in Java. I know if you actually go to the package of where the scanner is located, then you can kind of narrow this down a little. So up here is the packages. I'm gonna click on Java.util, and now I can like make this frame a little bigger, and I can look for the scanner class and find the scanner class where you scanner class. Right here, click on that. This frame here loads with every, everything you need to know about the scanner object. Not gonna require you to read all of this, but you should know the stuff from your book. If you scroll down, you can see the different methods you can invoke on a scanner. So one of the things that we haven't been doing is we haven't been closing our scanner. Uh, we don't really need to because, or do we need to? No, I don't know, maybe it's bad practice not to, but we're not reading a file or something like that that we can take ownership of. We're just listening to the keyboard. Um, and our programs are pretty linear, so once it's done, like it's just gonna lose uh, input from the keyboard. Like it's not like reading a file stream or anything like that. If you use a scanner class to actually read a file, then you should close it when you're done. Otherwise, you're gonna put your file in some weird state where if you try to edit it or delete it, I don't know if you guys ever run this problem on Windows, you can't because it says other programs using this file, right? Like that's kind of like the lock it puts on it when it's trying to read that data. But anyways, I know there's a lot here. The ones that you're going to be, you need to know for this course is like the next, let me see. So we have the next, we already showed you the next, that you get a string. There's a next int somewhere, or next byte. There's a next double, next float, next int, and next long. Next short, I don't know if you guys see that, right? Next short. And that's pretty much it. Like that's all we're gonna talk about in Java one, as far as the methods that you need to know for the scanner class. So I, I realize like there's a lot of information on these pages. It's always good to read through them and kind of figure out how to use some of these classes. But in your book, it kind of limits you on what methods it wants you to know. And those methods are, I'll go ahead and just type them here in this demo. I'll put a slash star and then close it with a star slash. Okay, those methods are next line. Next int is probably the next like frequently used one. Uh, next float. Next double. Um, oh, next, right, it just gives you the string. And then you can do like next byte, next uh, short, next long. Right, if you wanted to, but I think these are the three important ones that the book emphasizes, okay? Or not three, these are the important ones that the book emphasizes. Uh, and I don't really ask you any questions outside of these, these five here, okay? So it's important to know what they do. So this one here, this is actually, you should know, scans entire line, okay? Scans next token as int and the rest are the same. I'm putting comments here. I'm already in a comment. All right, so yeah, let me just line all this up.
All right, so knowing this about the, the int and the float and the double, uh, you can run into some problems. So let's just say I ask the user, I'm gonna come over here and make an integer called fave num, okay? And then I'm gonna ask the user to enter his favorite number. All right, I'm gonna prompt the user to enter his favorite number and I don't know why I keep doing that. I'm gonna store uh, his favorite number into this variable fave num. So I'm gonna call my scan dot next int because I want it as an integer. And then down here where I'm printing all other information, I'm just gonna say your favorite number is and print off their favorite number. That seems pretty simple. Come over here, clear my screen, then compile and run. I'm gonna enter my name, uh, enter your favorite number. Press enter. Everything works like pretty flawlessly, okay? Now if I were to do the same thing, and now it's asking me for my favorite number. So the next token I enter, it's gonna to try to make that an integer. If I were to just say like, oh, you know what my favorite number is two. Press enter, it crashes, okay? Now what happened was it's looking for, it's, it's saying input mismatch exception. It's trying to read, it, it looked at the next integer, or excuse me, it looked at the next token, it wanted that token to be an integer, but that token was a string. It, couldn't convert that string to an integer, so it just like barfed all over itself, okay? Now this, like handling these types of exceptions is something that we're gonna do in the next Java programming class. So don't worry about this. Just assume that the user is going to give you the correct data. If you ask him for a number, you can assume they're gonna enter a number and not a string, okay? Um, but that will happen, right? Because it's trying to convert that string into an integer and it can't do it. All right, I just wanted to show that. And there's one more other thing I need to show you about the scanner. And this is actually an important one. So I'm gonna go ahead and make another scanner demo because I don't wanna, this should be like in its own demo. Um, I'm go over here, make a new one. I'm gonna save this as scanner. And you're gonna run into this in chapter two, I think. Wait, yeah, chapter two. One of the homework problems, if you, some people might have, if you start early, you might have already kind of run into this problem. Uh, I'm gonna call this scanner demo problem, or scanner problem demo, how about that? Scanner problem demo, yeah. All right, and where's my cursor? I'm gonna save this as a Java file. All right, so I'm, I know I'm gonna need my scanner, so I'm gonna say import java.util.scanner. All right, I'm gonna compile and make sure it compiles. Crazy that I can compile right now, right? So I'm gonna say Java scanner demo problem. Damn, I passed it. All right, wait, uh, I think about it. it compiles, right? That's crazy that it compiles. I don't have a class or anything, right? So if you wanted to enter that line in first and then compile, you could. If you like, you screwed it up, you did something dumb, it would catch that error for you. And you know, so if that's the first line you wanna go compile, you can do that. All right, but anyway, so I'm gonna put in my class and my main method. So I'm gonna say public class, name of my class, and then public static void, damn it, main string array arguments. All right, so I'm gonna declare my scanner. So remember, this could be any valid Java identifier right there. If you wanted to do something really like different, you could do something like that. That's a valid Java identifier. And wait, wait, where's my cursor? Dang it, I'm messing up. Okay, so, okay. You can say this is equal to new scanner system in. 
All right, and then I'm going to have a string for the name and college and uh, what else? Name, college, age, and oops, actually not age. Okay, name, college, and pet name. This is one of the homework problems actually. And I'm going to have an integer for the age. All right. So I'm going to prompt this user for all this data. I'm not going to use the token scanner because a name can be more, like, can it have multiple spaces in it? A college can have multiple spaces in it, right? North is to college. There's a bunch of spaces in that. So I'm going to just prompt them for the data. So I'm going to say something like, enter your name. Okay, it's going to enter a name. And then enter your college enter your age, enter your pet name. All right, so come over here. All right, and I need to scan all that data, but I'm gonna go ahead and just print out my output right here. All right, your homework problem tells you like, make some greeting like, hello, whatever, whatever. Hope you're having a good time at whatever college. You're this many years old uh, and you have a pet, right? Named whatever. Okay, but I'm not gonna do all that. I'm just gonna say, I'll make it like this, like name and then show them their name, okay? Um, and I'll do college. Age, and pet, pet's name. All right, so I'm prompting them for all this data. I'm going to have to, man, I totally made that word identifier. All right, I'm gonna have to store all the data into each one of these variables. So I'm gonna say next line here, right? Because I want the entire line and then for the college, I also want the entire line. Um, wait, wait, what am I doing? Dang, I'm so confused. This thing's throwing me off. I'm trying to prove a point with the identifier and it's making me not see correctly. So next line, okay. You can ask for the age. Now the age is not gonna be next line. The age is actually gonna be, um, your scanner dot next int. Okay, and your pet name is gonna be pet name is equal to your scanner object dot next line. Because your your pet's name can be something like Mr. Fluffy or something like that. Yes. Uh, in the uh, print you uh, spelled the college variable at the end at the second one. Print, 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 print. Oh, thank you. Good catch. All right, so I'm gonna save this. Everything looks good, right? I just, I mean, this identifier is throwing me off. I was just, I'm just trying to prove a point. I'm going to change it after I compile and it runs so I could show you that that's a valid, valid Java identifier. So come over here, compile. It didn't compile, dang it. I forgot to put this semicolon on my import. All right, so clear my screen, compile, compiles. That's crazy. So run scanner demo problem. Scanner. Scanner problem demo. All right, your name. So let's say like, uh, I don't know, Bob, blah, blah. Okay, college would be Northwest Vista College. Okay, age, uh, the student's 21. Okay, I press enter. It didn't ask me for my pet's name. It just immediately just stored some value for my pet's name and then said, uh, your name is this, your college is this, your age is this, and your pet name is like blank. Okay. So this is a problem with the scanner. Okay, now what's actually happening is we're having this word problem. Let me just put this new line here. Actually, let me fix this variable. That way it's not confusing anybody anymore, especially me. It's confusing me. All right, so scan and scan, scan. All right, let me run this one more time. Compile. 
run. So I said Bob, uh, blah, blah, and then college, say Northwest Vista College, age, she's 21. I press enter. All right, so what's happening here is I'm going from a line scan to a token scan, then back to a line scan. So this is what's going on is I ask him to enter in a name and remember the scan next line reads up until the new line character it's going to store that value into name then it asks them for their college it's going to read up into the new line character and store that value as their college then I ask them for their age it's a token scan so it's only going to read just the just the age part of that okay and then it's going to continue now, because I entered, press entered on that line, if I do a line scan after a token scan, what's gonna happen is this line scan is gonna grab the line that the uh, age was typed on because I did a token scan there, right? Type the age 21, press enter. It took just the number off of that line. It left behind the new line character. So that next line scan just grabbed that new line without the number on it and it used that as the pet's name. Okay, so there's several ways to solve this. Uh, I see and the, what I've seen students do is they'll just make age a string, which I kind of feel is wrong because age is, is always gonna be a number, right? Um, the other thing you can do is move age to the bottom and ask for the pet's name before the age. That will also fix the problem. But since we're privy to what's going on, what we can do is we can just call a scan dot next line without capturing the data right we're just going to call it scan dot next line and this is going to release that new line the empty new line release the empty new line All right so we're just kind of just letting it go like we're saying because we're going from token to a line we know that we're going to leave behind this new line character we're going to assume that the user is going to press enter right we're making that bold assumption um, and we're gonna go ahead and release that, okay? Now when I come over here, clear my screen, compile, run, and then I'll just say something, or just, wait, let's say like Bob, or just a bunch of, okay? And my college, uh, okay, I'm the age, 21. And now, right, I released that new line, so now I'm able to enter the pet's name, and I'll just say Rover, and then it gave me all my information. All right, now it's not like a foolproof plan because there is some other problems that could arise, like, hold on, let me do this, clear my screen. Okay, so let's see what happens if, when I ask them for the age, they enter in a value with a space on it, right? So I'll type in my college, And then the age, for the age, I'll just say like 21 space. Okay, I'll press enter, we're gonna see what happens. Okay, so what happened was it read only the 21 there and it left behind all of this. Now because I called that new line, it left all that. Like just say like he wanted to put 21 in his pet's name. Okay, it left behind all that and now I'm able just to enter in my pet name rover and everything works fine now the reason why i say like well maybe this might not work as intended is because maybe perhaps like on this line you wanted to ask for the age and also the pet's name i have no idea what you want to do but releasing that calling that new line to release anything after this will get rid of anything on that line does that make sense so if you're looking for line inputs like prompting them for a line like enter your name read the whole line string right enter your college read the whole line um that would be your college. Enter an, enter an age, okay? You just pull off the age token, call that new line. You kind of just, you're technically you're reading the whole line and you're releasing whatever's after that token. And then the next time you read a new next line, you just call next line and it, you, your dog can, you can read whatever they enter for their pet name after they press enter. Okay, does it make sense? I know it's a lot of information to digest but this problem is actually seen a lot. At least three or four students run, run into it every semester. Uh, even though I explain it, they'll still run into this problem. Okay, so remember, 
token scan and line scan, there's a huge difference. The token scan is just gonna pull what it needs off a line. The line scan is gonna read the entire line. So if you have a token scan before a line scan, you're gonna have to free up that line if you don't want it to be part of the line beneath it. The line scan beneath it. Does that make sense? All right? All right, cool. All right, so 750, that's it for chapter two. All right, 752, I still also have to talk about pseudocode, so I'm gonna do that on Monday. That's, some, that's a topic for chapter two as well. Uh, it's kind of too late to give you guys a quiz, so I'm not gonna give you a quiz, but you need, a, you need a already start on your homework. Now, before I let you guys go, I'm gonna read you one of the homework problems so I can strike fear into your hearts. Um, let me see, what is the website for the, for the book? Actually, does anybody have the book on them? Let me see. Um, something bookshelf, bookshelf, our bookshelf. Damn, I already forgot. It's not course smart. It's not, oh, vital source, vital source bookshelf. All right. Um, I'm come over here. Click on this. It has my info already. And I'm going to continue reading. I'm going to go to chapter two. And I'm going to go to programming problems. Now I'm giving you, I, I think, let me just pull up the homework really quick so I can see how many homework problems I'm giving you for chapter two. That's the reading. Our chapter two homework, there's, look at all these problems you have to do. I know it's crazy, but that's just the kind of instructor I am. I give you a lot of homework, make your life miserable, but it's not really a lot if you understand how to, like what you're doing, because a lot of it is just doing the same thing over and over, okay? But the one that I wanted to talk about was 2.9 or 2.10. Okay, so here, here it is. Okay, so 2.10, write a program that determines the values of coins in a jar and prints the total dollars and cents. No, that's not it. Dang, which one is it? Oh, it's 2.11. Dang it, I didn't give it to you. What the heck? You know, I'm going to give you guys 2.11. I'm sorry. Because it's a really good one. And I, I like you guys to think through it. Okay, so write a problem that prompts and reads for a double value representing a monetary value, then determine the fewest number of each bill a coin and bill and coins needed to represent that amount. Starting with the highest, assume that the $10 bill is the maximum size needed. For example, if the value is $47.63, your program should be able to print out uh, four tens, one five, two ones, two quarters, one dime, zero nickels and three pennies right so there's a lot of calculations that you got to do on that number okay i'm gonna i don't know why i didn't include it it's my favorite one to give all my students um but on monday i'm gonna talk about using pseudocode we're gonna use pseudocode to help us understand how to answer this problem because this is something we do on our head every day if i told you i had 13 dollars and 49 cents immediately you could tell me okay well that's 110 three ones one quarter uh i guess not immediately uh one dime when i said 49 right one nickel and four pennies right like that's just something that we do in our head all the time because we use money all the time right but what are you actually doing in your head when you do that right like that's what you have to like figure out and translate that into a program like how do you tell your program hey this is how i did it in my head this is what you need to do in your head all right what you actually do you take that $13.49 and you divide the whole thing by 10, right? How many times does 10 go into $13.49? One time. That's how many one $10 bills you have. Then you subtract that amount, 10, from what's left, and you get left with $3.49. Then you ask yourself, okay, well, how many times does one go into $3.49? Three times, right? So then you subtract three from that value, and now you're left with 49 cents. 
same rules can be applied with quarters, even though they're fractions, right? So now you're going to divide that value by 25 and figure out what, how much you have left. So how many times does 0.25 go into 49, or 0.49? Just one time, and the remainder would be what you work with, right? Like this is stuff we do in our head all the time, but when it comes time to write a program for it, it seems like super complicated. If you're able to write pseudocode and explain the math that we do in our head, then this program is actually really simple to write. It's just breaking that number down piece by piece, okay? We're gonna do that on Monday. We're gonna talk about pseudocode and I'm gonna show you how to tackle 2.11. I'm gonna go ahead and sign you 2.11 as one of your programming problems. Okay, any questions? Okay, so that's all I have. You guys are free to go.